The idea was presented that we could possibly play at the Georgia Aquarium about a year ago. It was intriguing to me and my bandmates, so when that opportunity arose, we said yes. I've been there several times uh, since it opened. I go there at least once a year. Obviously, it's a great place to bring people to come to visit. You just can't wait to get to that last room, you know, because you know that they're just going to be blown away when they walk in and see that thing and see all those whale sharks and everything, that tank full of amazing fish swimming around. I went there for a fable. God, stupid questions. <laughs> Shut up. I used to go to the aquarium when it first opened because my kids were just born, so we had like a season pass or whatever, and we go there all the time. Cause my kids are growing up now, so I was like, this will be neat. The idea of playing in that big room with all those amazing uh, species was cool, especially the Goliath grouper that was hanging out for a while behind me, and that really jerk sea turtle tank. Because I heard some stories about him that were not favorable, and I'm not gonna, you know, tell-tale, but not the nicest turtle, turns out. One of the first things we thought about when we had the chance to play the aquarium was to perform our Leviathan record in its entirety. But you can only make so much noise there to not disturb the animals that are just right behind a thick sheet of glass. So the idea of, of playing that record in its entirety was scrapped because Leviathan's a very intense album. But we do have a very sincere connection to the ocean, hence the Leviathan record that was based on Moby Dick. You know, honestly, I was just a little nervous at First, like I don't know about doing our song Mastodon acoustic just because we're such a known f to be such a heavy band. And the biggest challenge was to figure out what type of set of Mastodon music could translate into a stripped down acoustic version of ourselves. We all pretty much agreed right away like these songs those will work. If we can do something unique something we've never done before take a heavy song and, and play it acoustically in our career, play for some fishes, some whale sharks. I'm all in, let's do it. When playing them, it, you know, I would kind of go back to, wow, like, wow, that was, we recorded that on remission, uh, like our first record, and then, oh, that was, that one, Naked Burn, that's off Leviathan, and then here's a Blood Mountain song, here's a Crack the Sky, here's a Hunter. It touches on our whole discography. Naked Burn, I think, was one that was interesting to me to redo, and I always really loved that song. I remember when Brent wrote it, he had the whole thing worked out pretty much start to finish. Yeah, so I think we added some stuff at the end, you know, some, some guitar trickery to make it more difficult, you know, because we like to do that.
song like Asleep in the Deep, that was kind of a no-brainer. I was like, that one would be really cool sounding acoustically, I think. The thing I remember most about that song and, and the recording of it when we initially did it was, you know, we were watching Rosemary's Baby. We just had Rosemary's Baby sort of on a loop in the lounge. And to me, that song, for some reason, just felt like it fit that probably just because we were listening to that song and the movie was on nonstop. So, um, but it felt like that party at the end of Rosemary's Baby where the, where the child is revealed. The eyes. This is one of my absolute favorite tracks off the Once More Around the Sun album. The opening lick that Bill plays is, is very intriguing to me and it's always reminded me of the MASH theme song. So every time I hear it and every time we play it, I have visions of Klinger in my head. For me, there's something like, there's something sweet about it, but there's something dark just underneath it. And uh, lyrically, I use like some personal stuff from when I was a kid. And my grandmother came over with this priest to like exercise some demon that was in our home and was throwing salt in the corners to exercise this demon. And she's like, you hear that? That's the hissing of the, the demon. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's the salt hitting the wall, but okay.
So I think like looking back at a song like, for instance, The Czar, which was written in a, in a very, just a crazy part of our lives, I guess back in like 2008, 2009, there was a lot of crazy, we were just crazy, different different people back then, you know. Brent had written that after coming out of a coma. I think revisiting that song, The Czar, I was just really interested to see like, what will this sound like acoustic? And can we bring it new life in an acoustic version? Because here it is 12 years later and we're different people. We're still playing the same song, but now it's kind of a, uh, it just has a different vibe because Braun's playing it different. Lee on drums, um, the guys are singing it a little bit differently. You know, I guess that's when you find out, like, well, the song's still a very powerful song and it transposes to acoustic very well and the, the feeling is still there. And I remember when the song was nearing its completion, I personally recognized that uh, and felt like we were really onto something very special and creating something that we had always hoped to create. And uh, since then, Crack the Sky's gone on to be a our pinnacle achievement, I believe, and uh, playing the czar live is often a crowd favorite, and that's definitely a highlight for me.
well, Skeleton of Splendor from the new album is super personal. You know, it deals with uh, our one of our best friends and manager, uh, Nick John. The dedication and the force behind the scenes of any and all things Mastodon was our late manager and dear friend Nick John. And after his passing, I was very angry for a long time. His life can be incredibly cruel to some of the best people on earth. As far as the new album's concerned, you're not gonna find too many songs that don't deal with that uh, particular tragedy or that death. You know, for us, it was a, a huge one. And, you know, one of our best, best friends, and we wouldn't be where we are as a band if it wasn't for him. The magnitude of his passion for us and my gratitude towards him fully hit me at the same time and I was very inspired to put pen to paper and write what I hoped would be a very heartfelt thank you for him. He deserves more than that song. He deserves every song and probably will find, a, find his way onto every recording that we do from, from now on. You know, Skeleton of Splendor, I think, is the one that, for me, the, the, probably the closest to home and the most personal as far as like what we're currently experiencing. I wish he was here to, to, to see the aquarium gig and how cool he would, he would be so excited, you know. The person that we most want to have hear the song, he can't hear, hear it, so that sucks, but um, yeah. Yeah.
Brent came up with the, the beginning and everything, and then Bill played that sweet little um, delayed melody over top of it. I remember uh, Bill getting really frustrated with Brent and myself because we were like trying to coach him on, you know, he was fi trying to find the notes, and, and me and Brent were getting really excited because it was sounding really cool in practice space. And we were like, no, no, yeah, yeah, put your finger there, yeah, do that. And he was just like, we guys shut up, stop, let me do it. It was funny. <laughs> We do that, but we get, you know, you get excited about something and, and then you don't realize you're being a jerk. It's time to step back, look in the mirror, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And then I remember the whole ending part was like something Bill and I came up with and we just added it on there. And uh, I remember Brent being like, it's like, t it's like a whole other song now on the, on the end. Like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> we were like, I don't know, it sounds cool. Uh, so there was some back and forth about that. But it ended up staying in and I think it, it was cool. We're weird like that. We like, to, we like to change the song completely at the end sometimes and put a whole different song on the back end of a song. Like you thought the song was over, it's going to be a different song now. Here you go. Hope you like it.
Sparrow was the last song on The Hunter, and it was dedicated to our accountant, his wife, Susie. She had passed away, and we all went to the funeral. She died of cancer, so she knew that it was coming, so she eulogized herself, and at the end, it said, pursue happiness with diligence, and that sort of stuck with everybody. So in order to honor her, we had that be the only lyric of The Sparrow. And this is a beautiful song that Brent wrote, and when it came time to do this acoustic set at the aquarium, we, we wanted to include it because it was sort of in that same vibe of the, of the Wave Goodbye songs from previous albums. And it had a beautiful guitar solo in it, and it's just a real pretty song with a pursue happiness with diligence.
The thickening, as far as like, I remember it was uh, the whole beginning part was something that Brent had for another band that he was playing in. I mean, he wrote it, you know. So that whole beginning part, you know, he was questioning whether or not that was right for Mastodon, you know. And then we got in and we were, we were starting to work on the Hunter and it just was taking on a whole different feel, you know, from anything that we'd done before. We both said, I think this would be cool, you know, like, let's put it in there. We're, since we're just sort of stepping outside of ourselves for this album, let's step out as much as we can, you know. And so that whole beginning section, it's kind of sweet and nice and it's kind of pretty, you know. We don't like to be pretty, but we can't help it. We're just pretty.
like that uh, elephant man looking fish though. The parrot fish was actually, we renamed it the elephant man looking fish. And uh, that was dope. I thought that was cool. And we looked at that a lot when he would come around. Because we were playing the Joseph Merrick and Elephant Man song and stuff. We we're just, I guess it's kind of an ode to him, that little thing we did there. It's a very peaceful song that Brent wrote and intended to be on acoustic guitar and he presented it to the band and we thought it was incredible and Bill was able to lay down a very tasteful guitar solo in the song and it turned out to be a very uh, poignant closer to our uh, remission album. And the idea of playing at the aquarium came up and we thought that uh, that'd be a cool opportunity because of the fact that you can't be the heavy loud band that Mastodon is at the aquarium because it scared the fish. So we decided that it would be cool to bust out some songs that we've never played live before, these kind of sweet little endings we used to put on our albums, then we'd dedicate them to the Elephant Man. We did like three albums in a row. We had an, an infatuation with the Elephant Man, which started for me as a, at a young age. I uh, saw the movie The Elephant Man by David Lynch and really connected with it. And I read some books on him and we just were really into The Elephant Man.
So there's another song called Pendulous Skin, which is also in the homage to uh, The Elephant Man. I remember being in Seattle and uh, recording the song and towards the end of the album session and uh, Brent had a, a beautiful piece of music that we all felt needed and deserved to be on the record. And it was going to cap off a trilogy of songs that were dedicated to the life of Joseph Merrick. Seemed a very uh, tranquil resolve after the chaotic experience of our Blood Mountain album.
I forgot like how beautiful nature can be and it's all right there in the Georgia Aquarium. Jamming these songs at the aquarium, it was kind of like the best chance to become one with the whale. I saw a lot of danger, but I felt safe. I guess, I mean, playing for the fishes was, it was really, it was magical. It was cool because like we're set up, you know, and you could see that, that they were super curious about it. And they just kept coming over and like looking at the drum kit, you know, and seeing what is that? I have never seen a drum set before. Thank you for bringing one for us to look at. I honestly feel like the fishes were dancing. They were really getting into it, you know. I remember when it was over, I was like, this is a great moment. That's no secret. We did a we did an album based on Moby Dick. So, you know, there's something about the water that drives men wild. What was this name? Um, uh, let me uh, tank. Yeah, I saw it um, several times, inciting you know trouble. She's a troublemaker. Tank was. You could tell. Apparently, when we were playing, he he was trying to grab something with. His I don't really want to talk about a turtle getting uh, and, and, and closed by our set. That's kind of weird. I think there was like a fish flew over the edge at the end for an encore and a couple of fish maybe. But I'm married, you know, I gotta, gotta keep that shit in check. I just ignored it. The sawfish saw what was happening. Dad joke. What else were the dad jokes you got? That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the one. I mean, I just get them, they come to me sometimes. I'm not a dad, but I, dad jokes come to me. If you guys want to email me.